Welcome to AIN Debrief, where we take a look back at the most important aviation stories of the past week by the AIN editors who covered them. I'm AIN Alerts editor Chad Trotbetter. In this week's episode, London-based editor Charles Alcock highlights the diverging views of Airbus and Boeing on sustainability efforts. Senior editor Kurt Epstein marks the rollout of the 1000th TBM series airplane. Washington DC-based editor Carrie Lynch gives an update on the state of the private aviation charter market, and Editor-in-Chief Matt Thurber talks about AIN's special coverage in October. Okay, so Charlie, uh, over the past week there's been a lot of news about sustainability, and um, it seems that the Airbus and Boeing have kind of split. They've kind of reached a fork in the road, and Airbus is going one way and Boeing is going a completely different way. So what's going on? Yeah, at face value, it does look like that. And what is so fascinating overall to me is that despite air transport being in probably the darkest crisis of its history just about, there's still this growing push for it to become more sustainable, for it to pursue the holy grail of you know carbon-free flying. And we have seen two very different responses from the world's biggest aerospace groups. So uh, first of all, Um, Probably the biggest news is that Airbus, just at the start of the week, unveiled three new concept aircraft that will be all hydrogen airliners uh, carrying between 100 and 200 passengers on flights of up to about 2,000 miles. So we're talking about sort of medium range airliners, not with huge capacity, but very significant capacity in the great scheme of things. And these would all be hydrogen powered. Airbus is saying, we're definitely going ahead with this. This isn't, you know, we're not just flying a kite here. By 2035, we're going to have a version of one of these concepts in commercial services. And they're saying this um, with the ba- some government backing. I mean, in Europe, where I am, there's a lot of governments, not just support, but insistence that the industry presses ahead with this. And, um, I, you know, I think Airbus is deadly serious. Now, on the flip side, just a f- three or four days before that announcement, Boeing startled quite a few people, including me, by just announcing almost out of the blue that they are closing down their Boeing Next Innovation Unit. Now, they only started this thing in July 2018, just over two years ago, and it was supposed to be the main sort of fulcrum within Boeing for all its work on uh, electric aviation and sustainable aerospace. And uh, this this unit invested in a number of small startups to try and uh, develop various EVATOL aircraft programs, and it, it included teams that were working on things like, you know, advanced air traffic management and all this sort of thing. So suddenly put the brakes on, you know, almost overnight. And to be quite candid in admitting it's because, frankly, the Boeing group is just hurting so badly because of the 737 MAX grounding and the fallout from COVID was quite a startling contrast with Airbus's um, uh, stance in the opposite direction. And we reporters put it to Airbus. We said, how on earth can you be doing this? How is it, Airbus, that Boeing is having to make all these cuts and put a stop to work like that, and you're pressing ahead? And the Airbus view is basically, we can't not do it. You know, There is an insistence now, both within society and, and governments, that air transport uh, heads towards a carbon-free future. And so they're, you could say they're going to kind of spend their way out of a crisis, I suppose. Um, now, just to be clear, Boeing isn't totally abandoning b- abandoning its helps, uh, its efforts to 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 make aviation greener, but it's taking a much more gradual approach now, and it's basically saying, yeah, okay, fine. Somebody might make hydrogen work one day, but it's a long way off. There are all manner of complications that have to be resolved. So instead, Boeing's going to focus on things like sustainable aviation fuel and improved routings for for airliners. And it's it's basically taking a gradual approach, whereas Airbus is saying, no, nothing short of a revolution will do. So how does Airbus plan to make hydrogen work? Well, uh, with, a, with a lot of engineering effort is the short answer. Basically, the three concepts that they've unveiled show three different ways for storing hydrogen within the fuselage. And it is true that one of the big challenges with hydrogen is the volume. Uh, that it has. You know, it, it basically takes up a lot of real estate within the aircraft to store it. And that's probably the biggest nut 
that Airbus is going to have to crack, and that's why they're starting with you know medium range airliners. Um, they are going to spend the, probably the next uh, four or five years trying to prove the concept that will establish whether that can happen. I think they said that by about 2025, they hope to have a technology demonstrator to show how this would work. You know, it could be they'll fall flat on their face and find that it's a lot more difficult than than they believe. Uh, but they're basically determined to uh, to to confront that head on and try and solve that problem. Yeah, and there's uh, last week we did a story. Actually, you did a story on a company called Universal Hydrogen, and they were taking an innovative approach to how to uh, basically refuel aircraft with hydrogen. Yes, that's exactly right. And uh, you know, this is part of a growing trend that we've seen in 2020, where hydrogen is increasingly being seen as the as the main platform for progress. And what's really curious is the the fellow who's behind Universal Hydrogen. Um, uh, Paul Aramenko is the former chief technology officer of Airbus, if you can believe that. And uh, basically, his concept is that uh, he wants to find a way to get around the objection that there commonly is to hydrogen, which is it will just require way too much infrastructure. You know, how are we going to replace regular aviation fuel at airport? airports with you know special pipelines and, and supply chains just to bring the hydrogen there so his concept is that he will bring the hydrogen directly to the aircraft in in special storage tanks you know almost like sort of propane tanks that that people's barbecues run on and basically take these directly from the hydrogen production plants and literally just sort of plug them straight in to the aircraft themselves so you you don't have to have a uh, you know, a very expensive supply chain. Now, whether or not Universal Hydrogen is sort of thinking along the same lines as Airbus, only time will tell. What Universal Hydrogen is saying is, rather than build a whole new aircraft around this, let's take some existing small regional airliners, you know, maybe no more than 40 seats, and convert them for use with these hydrogen capsules, as they call them. So we're now kind of in a race, you know, is is that is that sort of short-term approach of let's get this stuff into aircraft that already exist going to happen faster than Airbus with all its resources focusing on completely new aircraft? It's going to be a fascinating uh, thing to watch, you know, in terms of, of who gets to whatever the finishing line is first. With the A380 line um, basically being shut down and there's going to be a glut of A380s, couldn't Airbus just go ahead and grab an A380 and – do the same thing, a conversion, and make it into hydrogen? Well, I suppose in theory they could. Um, they, they have not mentioned that approach at all in anything that they've told us so far. Um, I get the impression that they feel there's lower risk with starting with a concept that is, is smaller than an A380. And I think their view possibly is that to make this work in the long term, um, you, you're probably going to be better off with purpose-built airframes that were built to, ha- to house hydrogen in the first place. Now, you know, I'm sure that the folks at Universal Hydrogen would say, no, that's the wrong approach, but they've got a pretty well mapped out plan of of where they want to get. And to be fair, whereas Universal Hydrogen is saying they believe they can get to market by, I think, 2024, 2025, Airbus is saying, no, let's take a whole extra decade and, and really start this from the ground up. And only time will tell whose approach is right. I'm certainly not qualified to say. It'll be interesting to watch at least. Very definitely. Yeah, get out your popcorn. So, Kurt, uh, Deher had some had a milestone on the TBM line this week, right? That's right, Chad. The uh, company produced and delivered its 1,000th of the uh, TBM family this week. And the aircraft was a TBM 940, its new top-of-the-line model, and it went to a U.S. operator. And um, it's, a, it's a long history for the TBM. And uh, according to Nicholas Chabert, who's the uh, Deher Senior Vice President of uh, its aircraft division, it's one they weren't sure it was going to get to. Their original uh, goal was to sell 600. It, uh, that was back you know, in the early 90s. Well, the aircraft, it was orig- it's based off the Mooney 301 from the uh, mid-80s. And... Um, Sokata, which was the original driving force behind the TBM, they were looking at the market and they thought that there existed a, uh, a slot for an entry-level 
pressurized high performance single engine turboprop. And they uh, th- approached Mooney and said, Hey, would you be interested in a uh, joint venture on this? And Mooney agreed. And the plans got so far as to even uh, have separate assembly lines planned for both the United States and France to produce this aircraft. But uh, at around the time, the plans were coming to fruition. Mooney encountered financial uh, headwinds and was forced to drop out. So Sakata carried the ball across the finish line, and it came out with the TBM 700, which entered service in 1990, and it's been steadily evolved ever since. I believe they're in their second, seven, I'm sorry, their sixth generation of the air frame, and uh, they also announced that in the ten years since. Uh, since the uh, the TBM model was acquired by De Haer, De Haer's produced more uh, TBMs than Sakata did in the previous twenty years. So they had that milestone. Yeah, and the TBM name actually harkens back from the uh, collaboration between Sakata and Moody as well, right? It does. the The TB stands for Tarbes, which is where Sakata was headquartered, and the M was Mooney. So TBM was uh, Tarbes Mooney. And the name is just stuck, and it's gone on to become well, you know, a I- pretty iconic name in the turboprop industry. The Harris are already planning for the next 1,000 uh, TBMs too, right? So they say. Chabert said that uh, they're going to continue continue pr- improving the aircraft. And uh, he said, you know, we our f- maintain our firm commitment to, con- to continue delivering aircraft that provide the optimum combination of speed and operational efficiency along with the highest levels of safety. So, yeah, they're, uh, they haven't shown any signs of slowing down as far as, uh, as, far as that goes. So, yeah, they're looking ahead for the delivery of uh, 2000, TBM number 2000. <laughs> There'll be a few more years, though. That it will. So let's jump over to Kerry. Uh, Kerry, you did some uh, research on the charter market this week. So uh, what's the state of the charter market right now? Well, the state of the charter market is actually a little better than – many corners of the industry. I mean, if you look at the operational utilization numbers, they're up with charter or they're approach. When I say up, they're improving and they're approaching, you know, typical numbers from pre-pandemic times. But, um, you know, it, it's just the whole market has shift. Most of the travelers now are private trips. They're personal trips. They're not business trips. And and that's a little bit of cause for concern. Now, on the positive side, in the good news area, is part of why it's bounced back so much is that there are new travelers coming in. And, you know, the, the charter people in the charter market have been discussing this. But the important part is what happens to these travelers moving forward? You know, um, how much is the stickiness, if you will? And um, I t- talked to the folks over at NATA and they said there are some reports of three, four trips now being booked by these new customers. But, um, you know, long term, will that sticker price eventually call, allow them to fade away once airline service comes through? So that's the big question. The other question is what's going to happen with the business travel? Because they're saying 80, 90% is still personal use, which means people are just not traveling for business. And this is an industry that relies on high touch, face to face. And, you know, there is some level of confidence that that will come back to an extent. But the fear is, let's say you're a company and you're planning five trips to seal a deal, the beginning, the end, and maybe three intermittent trips. Well, you might still do the beginning and the end, but the three in the middle may not happen. And instead of taking several independent trips, they'll they'll consolidate you into one as possible. And um, I talked to Raleigh Vincent, who said that they've surveyed people to get a sense of satisfaction with the Zoom meetings. And there's actually a high level of satisfaction about the business that can be done during these meetings. And that may play into what happens going forward. Now, um, with the COVID pandemic, there are a couple other factors that um, are playing into it that charter operators have to worry about. And one has to do with rescheduling. You go to fly a trip and the and the pilot comes down with COVID or one of the passengers come down with COVID and there's really no template on how to deal with it and who's on the hook for paying for it and who isn't. You know, there's some protections in the 
um, contracts, these force major, major uh, protections, which are supposed to protect the operator from acts of God. But is COVID considered an act of God? There's just, you know, so they're trying to figure out these things, things like cleaning. That's another thing. Some aircraft have been damaged because new travelers have come on board with their little Lysol canisters and wanted to clean out the back of the airplane. So they're having to deal with many issues. That's really interesting that there's so many things going on in the charter market. Do they have any sense of going into 2021, what it looks like? I mean, if they're booking three or four trips, that might be for the near term. Um, what are they thinking for 2021? Well, that's a giant question mark. Um, nobody really has real clarity on it. I mean, for 2021 to be successful, business travel has to come back. Now, on the encouraging side, and this is kind of an interesting twist right now, is um, jet card sales apparently are going like gangbusters, but in particular, jet card sales being sold by the operators themselves. So operators that might have a couple different divisions versus the brokers. And the reason being is there is a belief, now it's not in writing, but the IRS has said this verbally, that if you buy a jet card from an operator now, you're buying that transportation right now. And there is a federal tax holiday till the end of the year. So that seven and a half cent, uh, percent uh, FET charge on, the, on your charter fare isn't being assessed right now. So people are buying jet cards, but they're not using them for travel. So they'll have these hours available and that may cash in later on. But of course, the charter companies have already banked it. Now, the, with the brokers who are selling the um, jet cards, that money has not followed through. But that's but you, if you buy these cards through a broker, you're not going to get that FET holiday unless you use the travel before the end of the year. That's pretty interesting. Let's go over to Matt. Uh, so Matt, uh, Alien has an October surprise coming. So can you just give an overview of what, what that's going to be? Right, Chad. So during October... When the normally the uh, National Business Aviation Association holds its business aviation convention and exhibition, AIN is going to do some uh, special coverage during the month of October, and we're calling it October Means Business Aviation. Now, the reason we're doing this is because there is no NBAA show this year because of the COVID pandemic. But we felt that AIN's readers would still like to have some coverage, special coverage, uh, peripherally related to the show. And we're going to start by publishing a special edition of AIN's NBAA convention news. And this print edition will be sent to AIN readers around the second week of November. It's kind of like a 13th special print issue. Right. And we'll, we'll have a big online uh, presence too. Uh, can you talk about that? Absolutely. We're also going to have a special landing page for this uh, October coverage and people will be able to read uh, a lot of extra material. Uh, we're, we're uh, developing some special stories that probably would have come out uh, had had the NBAA show been going on. But we're also asking companies to share with us, with us any of the news they might have been holding for the uh, October time period. So we'll share that with our readers also. And we'll have a weekly newsletter too uh, to wrap up every Thursday. Um, and then we have a series of webinars too. Off the top of your head, do you know which, what the webinars are? So another way we're reaching out to AIN's audience during this special October means business, business aviation month is with a series of webinars starting on October 6th. We've got a business aviation update from trusted advisors, and we're going to try to take a really close look at what's really going on in the industry, uh, separating fact from fiction. And October 15th, we're going to discuss uh, environmental sustainability uh, especially as related to sustainable aviation fuel and how the use of that is really growing fast. 
October 21st, we're going to look at uh, cybersecurity for business aviation. This is a perennial topic that's of interest to everybody and is an important uh, factor that operators really need to take into account. Then on November 4th, uh, we're going to be taking a close look at the safety and performance benefits of auto throttles for turboprop airplanes. So we've got quite a bit of good content coming. Okay. And actually, uh, Carrie, uh, you had a really good idea for a story. Um, so why don't you go ahead and explain what, how that's going to play into the coverage for our October issue as well. Well, you know, in recognition that this year's MBA convention, MBA base is not going to happen, we thought it'd be interesting to kind of bring past bases, if you will, and conventions, me- annual meetings and conventions to our readers. So we've reached out to a diverse um, population of the industry, a group of people who we know um, have been from people who've been to the convention for many, many years, for decades, to people who are a little bit newer, who've played different roles in the industry, um, to ask them for their favorite memories from um, the convention. And hopefully we'll be able to feature some of these recollections, which I think will be great fun. And not only our print magazine that we're going to put out, but uh, put them all up online and also um, perhaps include them in our weekly edition of the alerts. And, um, you know, it'll be just interesting to get different perspectives from all the different people who came to the convention for different reasons. And it, and it, I think it just shows the value and the importance of that meeting and convention to the entire industry. Yeah. we we made a list of about three, three dozen people. So uh, there should be a lot of memories uh, that people can read and it should be uh, some of them are already coming in and they seem pretty interesting. So um, I think readers will like that a lot. Hopefully so. I'm looking forward to it anyways. Just want to say we we welcome uh, hearing from AIN's readers and also the companies that we cover. And please get in touch with us if we can help share your news with our audience. And if there's something you think we should be covering, please let us know. Okay, great. Thanks for listening to AIN Debrief. Another podcast episode will air next Friday. In the meantime, go to www.ainonline.com for the latest aviation news from AIN.